Tonight we're working on Chapter 5 in our book. The topic is Active Record. An Active Record, in a nutshell, is an abstraction layer that Rails adds to our capabilities, uh, the best way I can really say it. It basically handles a lot of the database interactions for us, and we get to use like a real simple syntax to do, to do all of our work. Uh, one of the components of Active Record is the fact that it operates on this object relational mapping, um, and we're going to talk about that in a second. But basically, um, what that does is it, it allows us to take database items and create objects with them, or create objects and give them to the database. Um, and there's some weird components to that, because basically what happens is um, databases aren't object oriented by nature so we kind of leverage some of the tools in Ruby and Rails to make that kind of interaction happen. All right, I got a few highlights in this chapter as I was scrolling through earlier um, so I'm going to clearly point those out but there's a lot of stuff in here that's really important and a lot of stuff that isn't necessarily intuitive as you read the book and, and try the examples so even if you have kind of worked through the chapter already or read it or skimmed it or whatever you do, um, I think that maybe the discussion here will help to clarify some of those things for you. All right. Um, it says here, the key feature of Active Record is it maps tables to classes, rows to objects, and columns to object attributes. So kind of getting a, a picture of that. So a table that we would have in a database that would be equivalent to a class so it would be kind of the blueprint and then when we put something into a database or a table row that becomes an object unto itself and then all the different columns hold the attributes for that object so if you, you kind of make that correlation with some of the object oriented programming that you've learned um, there is a direct connection so there's you know, when you're working with um, a class in an object-oriented programming language, very typically you'll have data fields within the class. Um, it might just be a couple, it might be a whole bunch, and that's really kind of uh, a tie-in to a database. What differentiates a class from a database is that it can also hold methods or, or functions that do particular things. So you can kind of leverage it a little bit. But when we're doing database interactions, um, a lot of the methods that you would use are ones that are basically built into the uh, architecture of these languages. All right, so let's take a look at uh, this little snippet of code here. They, this is code that we we don't have to type this. I mean, you can type it in if you wish, uh, but just take a look at um, the class definition that they have here. So they're forming a class called book, and by its nature it's going to extend active record. So in other words, we are basically saying that this is going to be a database type of object. It's going to hold some sort of a, a value. And then notice here, I highlighted that this part here, the, the less than active record colon colon base, um, that indicates that the book class on the left is a subclass of the one on the right. So in other words, superclass, subclass, or if you or if you will, this class extends that class. And that whole thing with, with the colon, that indicates that it is um, you know the one that we're pulling from from basically. Another real important thing that you're going to see here, because we're going to be working with a combination of like storing things and then pulling stuff in and out of tables, is it says, note that the table name is plural, where the class name is singular. So that's going to be kind of a different thing for us as well. So, and this is what I'm referring to here. So if you have a table in your database called books, which is a, you know, the, probably the name you would use for something like that, that when you actually create the, the class, the class is singular. Because if you, if you think about it, every record in the database would each be a book, so every object is a separate book singular. So 
there's a reason for it, and that's a, a, another one of those conventions in the language that you should get used to. All right, so take a look here at some of the commands uh, they're putting forth. Um, so if we have a class already formed for book, we can invoke a method called new, and then whatever that is gets stored in the variable book. And then there's going to be attributes, so like the data fields or you know that go with, you know, you know the columns that are in the table, and then you can assign them individually, like he's doing here. So you could say book title, give it a string, book publisher, etc. And then finally, after you've set those attributes, they won't stick in the database until you do a save. So we're going to actually do that in a little bit. So you see how that works. Now, what's kind of neat here is the database that we're using to do our development work is from SQLite, and we've already had to install that. And that's that's a, you know, a database I wouldn't call it a NoSQL database, but it's certainly not one that runs like MySQL or SQL Server, where it's this big, robust piece of software. It's one little executable and one DLL file. So there's not really a lot to it. Um, and the truth is, is that we can work with any type of database that we want. So if you had an Oracle database that you could connect to or SQL Server database, uh, there's just different connection scripts. Uh, and tie-ins to the application. But Active Record, they say, is database agnostic. So it's like once you have that connection to the database, the commands that you're going to issue inside of Ruby are going to interface with the database regardless of what's going on in the back end. So it handles all, all the transactions for you and in essence really writes the SQL code for you by doing these simple little commands here. So we do stuff that's really easy for us to know and remember, and Active Record kind of jumps in, writes the SQL statements, and pushes it to the database. Piece of cake. All right, so that whole concept is really, it's called abstraction, because we're not dealing directly with the SQL, which might be kind of a, like, a sigh of relief for some of you if you don't remember your SQL all that well, or if it's not really that big a deal. Um, I know like when we were doing advanced PHP, like our SQL statements weren't quite right. Remember that? Like we we're missing like a single quote or something and like nothing works. And this is basically an attempt to kind of prevent those types of uh, problems. All right, but when we're working with SQL, one of the, the, the things that's kind of weird is the fact that SQL is a completely different paradigm than working with a programming language. A programming language, we, we do sequential steps, we set up functions or methods, uh, we, we'll set up loops and all these you know, data architectures, and the pattern is very predictable. And, and with object-oriented languages, we really have that capability you know, to create those objects and, and leverage them. The problem with SQL, though, as I have highlighted here, is that it's not object-oriented. It works in a completely different fashion. It, it sets up uh, organizations of data, it you know, links data together, you can write some procedures and stuff, but it's really still not a programming language, and it's absolutely not object-oriented. So it kind of gives us a little bit of an, of an issue. So what happens here is that uh, we end up using what we call that ORM, which allows you to basically do an interface between an object-oriented uh, paradigm excuse me, and a non-object oriented environment. Now that um, library, Active Record, is based on what they call a design pattern and it's actually attributed to this guy down here, Martin Fowler, who wrote about it and apparently he must have spent a lot of time thinking about it because this is, you know, a good 15 years ago, 14 years ago, um, where he kind of, you know, and this is kind of like I wouldn't say the early days of object-oriented programming, but fairly early. Um, and he, he saw the issue between, you know, how the code interfaces with the database and how you might deal with it. So what he did is he set up a design pattern, which we're benefiting from now, and he called it Active Record. So that's where the name uh, comes from. Now, when they created these languages, 
Ruby and the Rails framework, they had that firmly in mind because it's kind of a hassle in programming languages often to do uh, SQL statements uh, depending on the syntax you use. So they did this abstraction layer that really kind of makes life basically easier. Now, whenever we're working with Active Record, uh, we are going to be doing things with data. The data part of Ruby on Rails in the MVC architecture is the model part, the M. And the model, as you're going to discover here, is not just the data and it's not just a connection to the database, it's actually uh, representative of objects. And the thing that they say here is uh, you model real world things, you know, and then you know, explains a little bit further what it is. So a model might be might be named person, product, or article, like what we're working on. So it's a kind of like a tangible concept. Um, and then we end up having uh, classes and tables related to those things. Rails jumps in. It handles all the interactions. It writes the SQL statements for us, and you know. We'll, you know, we can sleep peacefully, basically, or at least I hope. I know that this stuff will be a little bit overwhelming initially, but I think you'll get the hang of it. Uh, and through the examples uh, in this chapter, I think they do a pretty nice job of showing you some of the uh, ramifications. Now, if you take a look at these next couple of highlights that we have, uh, Ruby does work on this, basically this uh, convention um, the first one we already talked about, which is that class names are singular and table names are plural. And that's something you're always going to see. And you're also going to see that the tables have to have an ID column. And that's basically so that every record is unique. Um, so if you, if you were to actually look at the database that you create, you'll see that every record as it's generated has a unique identifier. And that's really a, a good database practice, regardless of what kind of database you're building. Um, and hopefully you were taught that way. Uh, de it depends on who taught you, but I, I'm, I'm pretty sure they probably did. All right, so if you take a look at this little table here, so the, the table column on the left, these would be the tables that we have in our database, and then the classes that would correspond within the application structure. So if we have a table called events, then we'll have a class called event. And then remember that the classes will build objects that will occupy a single row in the table. That, that's kind of the point. Um, so a lot of this stuff is kind of done automatically. And you notice that, OK, so events, event, people, person. They, it does, you know, and you got to think here, the, app, the application framework does this automatically for us. So if I create a table called people, it will create a class called person, which might not be where your mind goes initially. So you got to be careful how you name things. Uh, and then we have categories, plural, and then singular. Also notice that all the class names have a capital letter to start, right? So in that capacity, it's kind of similar to languages like Java, where we have to use a capital letter, letter to start a class. The other thing that they point out here is that if you have uh, a table name that is like this, where it has an underscore in the middle, and that's kind of a common database convention. If you have multiple words in a table name or a field name, that you, you know, word underscore word. And notice that order items then becomes order item, and it gets switched to camel case when it becomes a class. That's just how they do it. All right, last week when we were learning a little bit about the Ruby language and we were playing with a bunch of different commands, we were working from what they call the interactive Ruby prompt, the IRB prompt. Remember we were doing that? And here they're kind of revisiting uh, that topic. And they're going to make a little distinction here. And it'll, it says you can tell whether whenever you're inside an IRB session by looking at the double greater than sign or a slightly different sign depending on your environment. Um, and it'll depend on the operating system you're working on as well as um, what virtual machine you might be running with, within. Typically you'll see one of these two. Uh, 
All right, so in order to invoke the console, this is one of the commands that you can type to get there. So why don't we go ahead, I already have open a couple of command prompt windows, and I'm going to go ahead and navigate my way to my project. Now, even though the stuff that we're going to be doing here isn't necessarily going to interface with our project, I just want to be inside of a folder of some sort uh, where there's work happening. Uh, if we do get to the point where we're changing stuff within our application, and you know, I'm kind of thinking out loud here, probably should make a, a version of our work. So why don't we go ahead and do that? That's, that's a good place to start. So I'm going to go to my C drive here, and I'm going to do this graphically. It's a little bit easier. So I'm going to go to the Projects folder, and the blog that I was working on last time should be this one. You know, I'm looking at timestamps on, on files to make sure. And you can see, like last time I made a snapshot, basically, of my progress up to page 37. And I'm looking now to just make sure that I'm going to work on the right version. Now, this one's got a different timestamp on the folder. My concern is more the files that are inside. So if you remember some of the things that we did last time, all right, so it, it seems to me that this stuff seems okay. I know that we created some database migrations. I hope this stuff sounds familiar. All right, so what we're going to do then is I'm going to make a copy of my blog folder, and I'm going to rename it. Now, in the previous chapter, we really didn't do any work on our, our blog application. We just were working with the language. So I'm actually going to say chapter 3, complete. Right. But that is not the one I'm going to work on. I'm going to keep working on this main folder, but now I have a fallback. All right. So there's the folder. Everything looks okay. Um, let's go ahead and bring up the Rails console. So you just type Rails console. And hopefully in a few seconds here, we should get our interactive Ruby prompt. All right, and there we are. And then you should get a prompt that looks like that. Now notice... Our prompt versus the prompt that they're using. Whenever you see a, a dollar sign prompt, do you guys know what that means? That means that you're working in a, in a, at a Linux command line versus a Windows command line. In a, in a Linux command line, uh, that's typically indicative of working with uh, what they call the born-again shell or bash. So just a helpful little tidbit. All right, so let's actually start typing some commands here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to see if I can do a little split screening. And hopefully it'll work effectively. Let's try that again. You guys here in the room see the screen okay? Is that good enough? All right, so let's start typing some of these commands. Now, we already have inside of our application the ability to add new articles. Remember that? We could create them, and we got that part to work. And what I'm doing now is I'm typing a command that, that they're showing us. And it's pretty intuitive what this is going to do, right? So I'm going to type 
article dot column underscore names and it's going to do exactly what it sounds like it's going to it's spit back to us the name of all the columns in the table called article is it a table or is it a object we just talked about this right in our application we create articles right so the table name in our database is articles with a lowercase a so article is an object or one singular row you know that's the connection to our database so really what's happening here is an article object has these columns available to it that's what that's showing you now if I type in the next command article this also gives back information and what it shows us is not only the column names but the data type for the columns that can be handy too you guys have any idea why why would we bother if we're running an application like this why would we bother dropping down to the command line and typing in code when we could just type it into a text editor save it and our application reads it can you think of any reasons why they're a very talkative bunch by the way <laughs> the reason the reason why is it really kinda gives you a way to mess with code see if it works find out stuff about the models you're dealing with without actually having to write the code so it kinda gives you that kind of feedback alright so let, let's do this next command now that's article dot methods so you suppose that does size and if you look at the book Boy, it doesn't like that one, does it? Uninitialized. Oh, yeah. Okay. So you see what I did wrong? Capital R? That's right. Okay. So there we, there we are. So apparently since version 4.2, which the book was written on, I believe, or one of those version 4 ones, they've added almost a hundred methods to the library that deals with active record. Now that's pretty impressive. So if you were curious about what those methods are, you can actually go and look them up. Uh, but there's certain basic ones that you'll learn and a lot of them you can just kind of guess. I mean, without even knowing the command, what do you think this one would do? you see that list? Those are all the methods. <laughs> That's almost like the matrix, right? Yeah, th those are all the different methods that are available, and I'm not asking you to read those, but a lot of them are, are pretty intuitive uh, if you were to read them. So, for example, if I just um, public class method, uh, require dependency, you know, all these things, I mean, they're pretty easy to figure out. That's what's kind of nice about the way that they, they structure this. All right, the next little section uh, in the book here talks about how objects and classes are created. And I, I'm not going to, like, teach you object-oriented program from scratch. You guys should already kind of know this stuff. But you should also understand that you're going to have some sort of a class. In this case, their example is car. And we can also create a new instance of car. So we say car.new. It's a little bit different than other languages, but pretty intuitive anyhow. And then that new car object is stored in car1. Make another one stored in car2. And then you also have commands like this where you can actually figure out what class was this instantiated from and here's the command for that so if you're not sure then you can 
from the prompt, type it in and figure it out. So that's one way to do that. Now, of course, the class car initially started out empty, but notice that uh, we can actually do a couple of things here. And the things that we're going to do, uh, first thing, is they're actually putting methods into the class. So they're, they're uh, you know, this is basically kind of the equivalent of a get and a set. So a writer method, it sets the value. So make that, that correlation, writer equals set. And then reader is what pulls it back or does the get. So notice the syntax here. The writer method is going to receive a parameter, right? And that's going to be some sort of text. Then that gets stored in this variable. And what I want you to, to pay careful attention to is this little at sign here which we're going to be learning more about as we proceed. All right, so we're going to, let's say, uh, the, the thing that we're going to be setting here is the make. So we're going to receive, you know, something like uh, Toyota, and it will be set to the make. So that's going to be the, the data field that's going to be set. So that, there's kind of a correlation there with Java, if you guys want to make that tie-in. Um, and then when you want to actually see it, Notice there's not a lot going on here. We're actually pulling back um, that value by just simply calling it. That's all we do. So really, when you look at this syntax here, make equals, that's actually a method. So, I mean, if we were doing this in Java, you wouldn't have the equal sign. You would just have the parentheses directly after it. But it's telling you that we're defining something and this is how you call it and utilize it. So that's kind of a little different than other languages, but you can latch onto it uh, pretty clearly. Now, notice that they have that syntax listed here. And then notice it says this is because they can only be used on instances of a class, which is to say individual objects that have been created from the class. All right, and that's why we use the new thing. Now if we go ahead and create a new car called my car and we try to see what type it is, we're, we're going to see that it's nil. So it's not really going to show us anything. Now if we put a value into it, like Toyota was a lucky guess, right? Then when we type in that command, that will be set. And we can keep changing that and make it whatever we need, but it's still attributed to that car. So that car can be set just in that way. Just very simply by doing a make equals, when you do that, it passes it back to the class, and it ends up here because it's make equals. So you see the correlation there? So that tells you that it's a set. Now, that's a little weird, you know, if you're not used to it. So make equals, that's a set. And then notice make with the pound sign, or excuse me, just make, and not with the pound sign, that is showing you that it's set to Toyota. All right, now this is an acronym I know I've talked with all of you about in the past. And the acronym for CRUD, of course, uh, as they indicate here, uh, corresponds to database activities, the, the common ones, which are uh, create, read, or retrieve, update, or edit, and delete, and some people call it destroy. So, But the acronym holds regardless of what terms you use. Um, and those are very common database activities. And when we work with uh, Active Record, it's intrinsic to that whole structure. So that's what's what's cool about it. It handles all that stuff. All right, let's go ahead and actually play with some of this stuff at the prompt. So you can see we do have some stuff that actually relates to our application coming up here. Um, and the first thing they're going to have us do is actually create uh, a new object. So remember article, the capital A article, 
is going to be an object. So we're going to make a new object based on the class article. Classes have capital letters, so we're going to create a new instance of article. So let's go ahead and type in that command. So article, that's where we're going to store it. And we're instantiating a new object. And then you'll see the output is identical to what we have in the book. So it created it, but we didn't pass any values to it, so no, none of the columns are set to anything. And that's why we get back from the prompt the current value of this new object. It just spits back all the stuff. Notice also that at the beginning of the line, there's a little pound sign, and then there's also these brackets here. It's just, you know, Ruby's way of telling us what's inside there. Now the next command is kind of an interesting one. Now notice here we're using the variable name that we created. And I know it's really hard to see here, but this is the command that we typed right on this line. We created a new object, we stored it into article. So article, lowercase, we have this command here called new underscore record and the question mark, believe it or not, is part of the command. And what this is asking is does article have a new record? And the answer is true. What are the article attributes? Or what are those data fields? And now it's going to spit back kind of the same information we had before but in a slightly different fashion. And this time we're getting output that's got the curly brackets. And whenever you see the curly brackets in this language, it indicates that it's a hash. And, and a hash is just very simply a way to do an associative array or key value pairs, uh, if you want to look at it that way. So instead of index values, we have names, and then we have values that go with. And you see the, the different syntax here. So we have the name and then the value. Once again, there's nothing in there. So the next thing that we're going to do then is we're going to start actually putting in some values. You guys should try this as I'm doing it. We're going to say article title equals, okay, and they're doing single quotes, so we may as well do single quotes too. It doesn't really matter. All right. We get that equal sign uh, greater than prompt that indicates what we typed in, so it did read it. And then we have an article body. I'm going to see if I can just copy this. It's a whole lot of typing from my lazy fingers. And I'll paste it in. So article body is going to be equivalent to whatever this text is. All right, so that is now stored. We're also going to set the article published at, and we're going to put a date in. And notice the format of the date. Right. This is this is more the the European approach to it. Um, and if you ever you know, this is kind of a, a cool tip. If you guys ever name folders with dates and you want them to be really easy to find, you always start with year, month, date. And that, that way you can organize them by date a little bit more easily. All right, you guys can probably figure that out, I suppose. All right, so we did set it to that date. Now we're going to type our next command, and basically what we're doing is we're typing article again, just like we did when we started, and now we're going to see that some of the fields are set, and some of them are not. Now, the weird thing about what we've just done, and the book is telling you the same thing, is that even though we've created the object, we've started giving it values, 
it's not in the table yet. It's not saved to the database. And in order to do that, you do have to type the command article, the name of the object we're working on, and then save. Now, you, you can see the result in the book, but take a look at your screen here and look at what that command does. So it initiates a transaction, begin transaction, and then notice it triggers a command called SQL, and it writes the SQL statement for you. All right, so you should be able to, to understand this, right? Insert into articles, that's a table, and then in the order of title, body, published at, created at, updated at, the values, and notice the ones that are empty just have question marks, and then it goes through and it key value pairs items. Notice double square brackets, and this is SQL syntax. So basically what you're seeing is the stuff that we're doing which I think is a little bit more intuitive, replaces all that SQL code. And can you imagine if you had to type all that SQL code? It's kind of a pain. So this is um, the way we do it. Notice also at the very end of the statement, true indicates that it basically worked. Another handy little command here is article.count. Now he's getting back a result of one. I'm getting back a result of three because I already created two records within my within my application. So that just goes through and it looks at how many of those individual records, right, which correspond to article, capital A, that's an object, right? The class how many of those we have in the table. So that, that's the correlation, and try to make that correlation as you're working. And I, I know that it's a little confusing at first, but you'll be fine. Well, let's run that command again, article new record, and we get a false because we, you know, it's already written. So it's not new anymore. All right, so now they're going to have us create another article. All right, and then you can see they have several lines of code here. So you can copy-paste them if you wish. You do have to do them one at a time. Same basic thing we did above. We're just creating articles. Notice with this one, though, for the date, we just did date.today. Notice the different format. And then we're going to do article.save. And there's our SQL statement, and now it's in the table. Now, if you want to make sure it's in there, do that article count again. And now you can see I have four, which makes sense. There are actually more efficient ways to do this, and that's what they're about to show us now. So check this one out. And this is not that weird, because if you think about it, um, when you would instantiate objects in other languages, sometimes you do that with empty parentheses, and then sometimes you put things in, and you put things in in a certain way. So in this case, I'm not going to type this. I'm going to copy it. Although I might have to copy it in pieces. Well, let's see if it all pastes in okay. I get Adobe Acrobat to cooperate. I know I got the extra new in there, so I'm going to get rid of that here. Okay, 
Now, do you see what happened? Did this work? It did, and and it might not seem like it did because basically what it did. Here's the the Ruby prompt, and I entered a line of text. It recognized that there was a carriage return in here, so it reissued the the command line. But it noticed the little star there. That means that the line is still open, and then it carried on. Now if I press enter, you can see that indeed it did set those values. Introduction to active record. The body's got active record is, etc. Published at. Notice today's date. And then of course we can do the article save again. And you can see I just used my up arrow to, to go through the buffer of commands I typed. Once again, SQL interaction, it's all committed to the database. Taking a quick pause. So just as we were taking our break here in class, uh, we were talking uh, about, with one student, um, he wasn't sure if what he did wrote to the database or not. and. Of course, you can type command line stuff to check, but there's also tools out there that you can download. And one that's uh, pretty cool is called SQLite Browser. And you can see the URL here, sqlitebrowser.org. And it's absolutely free. You can download an executable file directly. Uh, so there's nothing to unzip. It just runs. Once you have that uh, loaded up on your machine, you can launch the application. And we're not going to download that right now. But I'm going to open a database. And all, all you have to do for that is go to your file system. See if I remember how to do this. Go into your application, into your database. And then notice it looks for these types of files, right? And we're doing development work right now. So that would be this particular file. And you know it is because look at the timestamp just right before we took our break. So I'm just going to go ahead and open that. And then what it does is it shows you database structure. So this is kind of like your architecture, right? Shows you all the stuff it takes to create it. It also allows you to actually uh, look at some of the data in particular tables. So if I look at my articles table, you can see the stuff that's in there. You can even expand the little columns. So if you're not comfortable with just working from the command line or having it render stuff in the browser, there are tools out there like this where you can manipulate the database. And you can see, it. I mean, it's like just like any other database. And, and the truth is, if, if you like SQLite as a database, it's one that's super lightweight and works pretty well for driving a lot of different types of applications, not just stuff in Ruby on Rails. You can use it for other type of work, too. Um, there's a big push lately in uh, the HTML5 world with that standard they allowed for uh, client-side database interaction so if you wanted to connect to a database on a user's machine this is one of the tools you could use so you could use SQLite uh, and run a database on the client machine without having to do any server interaction so that's kind of a powerful thing right there so just something to know a uh, tool to play with to explore uh, not an obligation in any way, but you might find it handy. So I thought I'd point it out. All right, so let's get back to work. Uh, the last thing that we did uh, was save this record here. And now we're going to actually try something fresh. And, well, maybe not all that fresh. But the technique that we've been using so far is you instantiate the object and then using one method or another, you feed information to it and then save it in the database as your last step. It's possible to actually do that all in one fell swoop. So there's a different method that's called create. And you see what I'm doing here is I'm pasting it into the notepad++ here, so I just have to copy one line. And 
with the create command, what it does is it saves it or creates the content and automatically saves it right off the bat. So all that stuff is there. So the fact that I did the title, the body. One thing that you want to notice, though, as you're typing that, is take a look at, at the syntax, how that's slightly different. Notice that the way the fields are named, right? So it's preceded with the colon here. And that's just because that's the way this method receives the parameters. So that's just a, a quirk. And it's not really a quirk. It's, it's the way that that particular method does it. Now, another thing that you can do, like take a look at this command. I'm just going to copy it. Once again, I'm going to take it to Notepad++ kind of as a buffer. I'm going to paste this in. Now, this one focuses on just the attributes. So you, you see that I don't have to create it, obviously, because it's already been created. But I can leverage those components and just change the data because we're currently working with that object. So I'm going to go ahead and come back over here, press Enter. And of course, what they're doing is they're adding additional components that weren't there before, right? So notice the result after we type it in. It just feeds back that same hash that we just typed. Remember, whenever you're seeing those curly brackets, it's, it's called a hash. All right. Now, what happened here, this is a variable, attributes, and then we're feeding that hash to attributes. Then when we come down here in the next command and we do article create, I, I guess I probably shouldn't do it that way. <laughs> All right, let's... Let's do it the long way. And then we're just feeding that variable to it. And it takes that whole hash, which is basically, you know, it, it's a key value pair structure. And it feeds it in. And then the create method knows what to do with it. And basically adds that to that object. So now we're going to check to see, and that's what they're doing here, is did it actually add to the database? So let's do a count again, and it's 7. Now if I want, I could actually bring up that SQLite browser, and once again, I can open up that same database, and it's just a you know, to get a visual view of the thing. And then if I look at the articles table, you can see that it did add those two things. And notice also that some of these fields, you know, they're, they happen automatically, like these created at, update at, published at. That's one that we created this is one that's automatically generated by the database and of course that ID field which is also uh, generated by it. And hopefully that worked for all of you. Now there's some other methods that they have here that are pretty useful. Uh, one thing that we do with a database often is we do queries. One of the points of doing a query, right, remember the word query is basically question, you know, ask for something. And often you'll query for a particular piece of information um, to see if it's there or if there's many like it or, you know, it meets certain criteria. And uh, Active Record does have mechanisms for doing that. Now, it won't be in the form of typing a query. Although on the back end, that's what's going to happen. That's what the abstraction layer is going to do for us. 
Now it's indicating here that you can do a find of information a few different ways. So this particular one would find a single record and it says or multiple records if the ID is an array of IDs. Well that, that's a separate issue. Um, we have the all uh, approach which says find all records in the table and then we can do first and last to get the first record or the last record. So that might be useful. So let, let's just try this and let's do article find three. And what do you suppose that three is going to be equivalent to? So I'll say it at once. But take a look at the SQL statement that's generated by it. Select articles dot star from articles where articles equals ID what's the ID three right so in other words if we go back to our SQLite browser here it should pull back this record now the one that the author is going to pull back is going to be different because our ID numbers are different all right but you can see that is indeed the one that got pulled up ID3, RailsConf, official gathering, etc. All right. And then it, it gives you the output. Now let's try a different approach, similar but different. In this case, we're running that same command, but we're storing the result of it inside of a variable. All right, so that whole structure. So really, this, this whole output that we see here, that's going to be stored inside there. So let's just go ahead and run it. And then the next command that we're going to type, now that it's stored in article, is we're going to say article.id. And then what that does is it goes into that code that was stored there, finds id, and pulls back the value that matches the key. So hopefully that, that makes sense for you. We can leverage that a little further. We can say article.title and sure enough it should be that. Now once again he's got a different indicator here that's because we have different record numbers but the results are essentially uh, the same. So another thing that you could do if you want to see it break, because sometimes that's fun too, is you could do the article find. And you can see here, he's, he's looking for 1037. So notice that he's not putting parentheses around it. You guys seeing that? He's just putting a space after it. Actually, let's, let's go ahead and, and just type it with a 3. And you can see that even though I didn't put parentheses around it and I just put a space and a three, it still worked. That's, what, that's the kind of language we're dealing with. It's like, doesn't really care, basically. <laughs> For silly as that sound, doesn't care how you feed it the information. But if I do put in a number here that's significantly larger, we know we don't have a record there, it is going to throw back a bunch of gobbledygook about it didn't find it. All right, so that, that's the kind of thing you see. Nothing to worry about, obviously, um, but it's not finding it. All right, so here's kind of an interesting thing. Um, in a lot of languages, or hopefully all the languages that you've been learning, um, eventually you try to throw in what we call error catching and we usually do that with try catch statements um, and Ruby has a similar thing and that is basically that we can do a statement like this so this would be the equivalent to the try and this would be the equivalent to the catch isn't that kind of interesting so this is what we'll try to do and then if it doesn't find it it has some sort of a mechanism for not crashing or throwing error messages out. So if you wanted to try that, you could. 
All right, so that's just a, a helpful little note. That's the equivalent of a try catch. All right, let's try this other command, uh, article first. And of course, it pulls back the first one that I have. Of course, we can verify that with the SQLite browser. And that's kind of handy. I mean, if only to do that, just to make sure that it's pulling back the right information, uh, I think it's helpful. Of course, um, with that one, if you guess what first does, you probably already know what last does. So you may as well try it. Very exciting. All right, another different approach here. We're going to run another method. This method's called all, and you can guess what that does. It's going to pull back all the records. It's going to store them in a variable. And notice here um, what the expected response is. So it's going to pull back in that same format, basically with the pound sign in front and then the, the bracket. And it's going to pull it back basically as an array of arrays. That's what it's doing. Uh, each article, and wherever you see the dot, dot, that means all the rest of it. Okay, so let's go ahead and run the command in the prompt. And then it'll pull back all the articles and just dump it as text. But it's structured in that it does have all this syntax in place, and it all happens um, you know, in a format that we can leverage it and use it in other capacities. So the next command that they demonstrate, when we take articles that class. Notice what it's uh, doing for us. And now I'm thinking that maybe I did this incorrectly. No, I did it correctly. But it's giving us a, a different uh, structure here. So here it's articles.class is giving me an active record relation. And here it's telling us it's an array. So there's some sort of little different that, that's hap happened between versions. or I'm just wondering if I maybe didn't do it right. Let me type this command again. You got the same thing I did? OK. And you know, maybe that's a more accurate description of what's going on. So let's just type that command again. Okay, so apparently we did nothing wrong. It just shows you that language has evolved. But, you know, it is different. So, <laughs> if you get a different thing, don't, don't worry about it, obviously. How big is the thing that we just pulled back? Mine seven, authors is five. Since we know it's in an array format, even though we got some sort of different message, and I will see if it actually is in that situation. So the first position in the array, which is position 0, pulls back article ID 1, right? Because in the database, the IDs start incrementing at 1. Okay, I think that's pretty simple. Uh, and then this one here, we can add a method to it. And it pulls that back as well. Some pretty, you know, really it's kind of uh, simplistic stuff. But it, it's also kind of cool because you see how simple it is. And you can kind of guess at some of it. Now, here's a, a little bit different approach. Notice here that we have a different command that we're running. And this one, whenever you see this each, it really is should strike a correlation for you that this is a for each loop. So it's basically a for loop. But when you do a for each, it uh, basically uh, goes through every possible thing in the array or whatever structure that you have uh, methodically. So when we do articles.each, um, it is going to basically pull back the title of each article. So let's type that command in. Make sure it's copied correctly. Uh, 
Now, the question is, is this what you expected to see? I'm trying to find the command. Right, so there's all the titles. Then following it, it is also grabbing that whole structure. Now, we got to remember when, when we're doing the stuff at the interactive prompt here, um, it's going to pull back what we asked it to do. So it's going to actually execute this, this loop and puts remembers where to echo to the screen or right line or uh, that type of thing. But then it also shows us the data that's associated with that object. So, you know, it's spitting back the whole structure to us one, one more time. All right, let's try this one. This one here, I think, is pretty intuitive. So we're looking at article, once again, we're running a method called order. What do you suppose order does? Sorts them, puts them in order, right? Makes sense. So this one, we're going to order the articles by the published at date. Now, given the fact that all of them are in the database in the order that they were created, it should pull them back in that order, right? Not necessarily, because there were a couple, I don't know if you remember this from the earlier chapter, where we actually leveraged the published at date to be different than what it is. So if you actually read through here, you're going to see that the first one is Article 3, and we looked at published at, it's set for 2013, so sure enough, that one was published first. So that's kind of the point on that one. Now check out this command. This is an interesting one, a long one. I'm going to take that over to Notepad++. I'm going to get rid of that extra line in there. But what this one's going to do is, once again, it's going to iterate over our uh, collection or array or whatever you want to call it. It's going to output the published at date. And then notice all of these. So where are these coming from? I mean, aside from the fact that I'm copy-pasting them. Am I actually changing those? Am I adding them? That's the question. Is this part of the command? Well, let's find out. If you guys are trying this... That is correct. So the put statement in this case isn't putting it to the screen. It's putting it to that column in the table. So what we're in essence doing is we're, we're changing the table. Oh, but notice I'm getting a syntax error. I was expecting end of input, but we didn't do that, did we? So what are we missing here? Bracket. We're missing a bracket, is that your guess? Oh, I see it. All right, let's take a look at that code that we pasted. And I think that probably the best way to do it is here. And I think it has to do, see, like, these dates, times, and then the UTC. The UTC touches that. So I don't know if that's a, actually a, a typo. So let's see what the syntax error says. And I know this is kind of a little mess to, to read through here. Okay, so here's the command, articles each, and then I got to this point, and it says interactive Ruby, line 47, syntax error, unexpected integer, is it because we have an extra one at the very end? Yeah, well, I, I think that the, the point is that UTC comes at the end of each statement, right? So that's a complete timestamp. This is a complete timestamp. 
the question really becomes is should there be a, maybe a space here or some sort of a, a delimiter? And yeah, that's a good question, right? You would think that you should just be able to cut and paste it, but it is indicating here. It says expecting end of input, and notice where it puts it. So console Ruby 65 in start. So it actually is giving us a bunch of different information. And if you're looking at it really carefully, it, it's telling us that there's some sort of problem that we're not catching. It's, it's a syntax problem. So now the question becomes, how do we fix the syntax? So let, let's take a pause for a second and see if we can figure it out. Kind of a little challenge assignment here. And we'll come back once we get it. Okay, so I think we figured it out. I'm going to test the theory here. But basically these timestamps, if you count them, there's one, two, three, four, five. But we have, at least in mind, seven articles, right? And we can, of course, confirm that at the prompt. Okay, seven. So what I'm going to do with my command that we were working with is I'm just going to add... You know, I'm going to copy the last timestamp. Oh, that's not the right place for the space, is it? No, actually, that's correct. All right, so let's uh, let's try this command then. All right. And that's hopefully what we're going to see. No, we're still getting a syntax error. So what I'm, I'm guessing here is that we still have a problem with the structure of the code. So let's see if we can figure that out. Once again, I'm going to flip on pause here for a moment. All right, so doing a little investigation here, I was looking at the command that I uh, copy-pasted, and I, I buffered it into Notepad++ so that it's all in one line. And then when I ended up pasting it to the prompt, notice what happened here. This part is fine. That's fine. Puts, article, well, that's not the same. In fact, not only did it do that, but it repeated it twice. You see that? So no wonder there's a, a syntax uh, error. So I think that what we're going to do here is I'm going to paste it in again, but try to clean that up. So I'm going to paste a long paste and then I'm just gonna back arrow here and see if I can fix that little tidbit so I'm not sure why it's pasting in that now here it looks fine doesn't it yeah that looks fine so let's shot again and it's still giving me an error. Well, I'm going to tell you what. I'm not sure exactly what's causing this problem. Because now when I look back at the prompt here, now I can see that it went incorrectly. So I think that what has to happen, um, and it's indicating, okay, error in line 50 right here. So you see that little pointer? So I'm wondering if it maybe doesn't read this correctly somehow. So I'm going to have to investigate that and kind of report back to you guys on it. It's not really a big deal because, you know, it doesn't really affect our application in any significant way. Uh, this is just a way to kind of force uh, dates in there. So let's move on to the next command. Uh, we're getting close to running out of time here, and I'm hoping we're kind of getting close to the, the end of the chapter, which may or may not be the case. And I'm actually going to do a little bit of uh, peek ahead here to see if that is the case. All right. Well, we're we're getting there. We're not quite done. So we're not going to finish the chapter tonight. We're going to have to do a, a Chapter 5 Part 2 coming up next week. But let's try the next uh, command here. All right, so this is the one that we just tried, which <laughs> failed horribly. 
But we do have this other one, which allows us to actually use, notice, a, a SQL type of command. Let's paste that one in. And I think it's pretty obvious that what we're going to do is we're going to take the published at date and we're going to sort in descending order. And that's exactly what it did. If you actually look at the published at dates, you can see the ones that were created today are at the top. And the ones that were created a while back should be at the bottom somewhere right here. All right, we have another one here with the universal time clock, which makes me a little nervous because <laughs> I have the, the feeling that whatever syntax issue we had before is going to follow us. Now, once again, we are missing um, some of these timestamps. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab two of them and append it. No, I'm not sure it did that right, and you can't control Z here, can you? All right, so let, let's try that whole command again. <laughs> Isn't this fun? All right, it doesn't like that. All right, I intentionally threw an error there to just try to get it correct. One more time, let's try that. My anticipation is that syntax issue is going to follow us. And then let me see if I can grab that little, just little bit of info. And add that to the paste here. All right, I think it did it correctly this time, but it's still throwing an error. So. There's a good chance that something um, changed in, in the language construct in version 5. So I'll have to do the investigation to figure that out. All right. Uh, next thing that we have here is, and this is probably the last set of commands that we're going to try, is when you do a find, but you're setting uh, some sort of criteria or uh, conditions. And that would be equivalent to what you might do in SQL. All right, so we're looking at article where, notice the SQL type of command here, where the title, column name, equals this, and then the first instance of that. So let's see if it comes back. And notice that it did run the SQL command. It did find an article with that criteria, and it returned it, and now that is... Um, active in memory. Let, let's run that same command. This time, instead of first, we're going to run all. And it just happens to be all of them, because there's only one. But that's how you would do it. And then they give also an example of this. And you can try this one if you want. Um, we have any called unknown? Uh, I would hope not. But notice that it re returns the empty square brackets, with, which indicates an array. And that also indicates that they did some sort of a change in the architecture of the language in those scenarios. Um, but those square brackets typically show that it's an array of some sort. All right, folks, that's going to be it for tonight. Uh, I'm going to create an additional video next week, finishing up this chapter, and then we're going to move into Chapter 6. Uh, the Chapter 5 homework uh, is due uh, coming up this weekend. I think I, I set it for Sunday at midnight. Um, so try to get your work in by then. And just uh, to reiterate that this particular unit that we're working in covers two chapters, it will extend over two weeks with the due dates for the assignments going a few days past uh, the day of class. So day of class is Wednesday, uh, both for online and in person, um, so that you get an extra Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday to turn your work in. All right, folks, we'll see you next week. This video ends now.